mechanism leading to a deceased state. Our objectives for this uh, session, you need to define key concepts of cellular adaptation, understand the pathophysiological mechanism of cellular changes, relate those cellular changes to the disease process, then correlate the clinical manifestation with cellular changes. We shall also examine the potential for reversibility of cellular changes and then look at some of the significance of dysplasia as a precursor to cancer. We had already defined human pathology in our previous session where we say that uh, human pathology is the study of diseases in human and it majorly focuses on the structural, functional and biochemical changes within cells, tissues, organs, and that can lead to a deceased state. <clears throat> so human pathology aims to understand the etiology, the pathogenesis, and the effects of these processes on the human body. Pathology generally helps us identify the structural and functional abnormality caused by diseases, and this facilitates the diagnosis of the disease, the treatment of this disease, and possibly prevention of these particular diseases. Cell division plays a critical role in maintaining the health, uh, health tissue functioning, uh, growth and repair, and it involves mitosis and meiosis. So for us to proceed with the topic, we have to really reflect on these two uh, processes. Starting with mitosis, mitosis is the process of cell division that normally ends with two genetically identical daughter cells from a single parent cell. It goes through uh, six uh, phases. We can refer to them as stages, starting with the interface, followed by prophase, then metaphase, then anaphase, uh, then goes to telophase, and lastly, cytokinesis. Mitosis is crucial for the growth and development of tissue uh, repair, and also mitosis is very key in asexual reproduction in multicellular organisms. So mitosis occurs in somatic cells, which are generally referred to as the non-reproductive cells. And the aim of mitosis is to ensure that it maintains the number of chromosomes. Those are 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes in daughter cells, just as in the parent cell. Starting with the interface, as we know, interface is the phase in the cell cycle that is normally characterized by increased cell size and DNA replication in preparation for cell division. So this phase of, of the cell cycle prepares the cell for the division. It is the longest phase of cell cycle and consists of three phases. We have uh, the G1, the GAP1, the synthesis, and the G2. Additionally, though, there is also an addition, an, an undividing phase of that is referred to as G0, where cells they normally exit the cycle and then they end up acquiescent or arresting state. So G1, um, during G1, a cell carries out its normal functions. So the cell increases in size and the organelles increases in the number. There is also a checkpoint to move forward. So if the conditions are okay like you have the necessary nutrients, the space is available, the DNA integrity, they all are favorable, then the cell can proceed to the S phase. Otherwise, this cell could also enter into the G0 or delay further uh, progression. That takes us to the S phase, which is the synthesis phase, and this step follows the G1 phase. In the S phase, DNA replication occurs meaning that the cell duplicates its genetic material. And this ensures that both daughter cells that will emanate from this single parent cell will have identical set of chromosomes. So that by the end of this phase, the S synthesis, each chromosome consists of two chromatids and joined at the centromere. Along with the DNA, the centrosome uh, also is duplicated. G2 phase uh, normally follows the S phase. So um, the cell grows, uh, continues to grow, and, there is, and it, there is a final synthesis of protein that is required for mitosis, right? Especially the microtubule proteins that will form the spindle fibers. 
So during this phase, the G2, the cell ensures that DNA replication has been completed correctly and the cell is large enough to divide. So at the G2M checkpoint, the cell then checks for any DNA or uh, DNA damage and ensures all material has been replicated correctly. If there are issues that are found, then the cell can delay progression to mitosis in order to repair the damages. Or if the damage is too severe, then it can initiate the programmed cell death, which we are all familiar with, the apop, apoptosis. G0 is also referred to as the resting or the quiescent phase. The cell can enter G0 from G1 if it is not actively preparing to divide. In this phase, you find that the cell is not actively dividing or preparing, to, uh, preparing for division. It may carry out uh, its normal metabolic function, but is essentially post in terms of cell cycle. Some cells, such as the neurons and the skeletal muscles, permanently remain in the G0 after maturation, so they do not divide again, while other cells, such as the liver cells, they can re-enter the, the cell cycle from G0 if stimulated by external factors. All right? Remember that G0 is a period when the cell cycle, in a cell cycle in which cells exit in a quiescent stage, and the G0 is viewed as either an extended G1, where the cell is neither dividing nor preparing to divide, so it's just in a quiet stage. So if from interface, we go to prophase, and uh, in prophase, we have chromat chromatin condensing into visible uh, chromosomes. The nuclear membrane will disintegrate, and the mitotic spindle fibers will begin to form. So, the spindle fibers will attach to the, to the chromosomes at the centromere, right? And we can be able to see on our diagram on the right. And that takes us to metaphase, where chromosomes are going to align themselves at the cell's equatorial plane. That is the metaphase plane, right? Spindle fibers uh, will attach, uh, will ensure that each sister chromatids, right? Um, each sister chromatids, that's a duplicated chromosome is now attached to the opposite poles of the cell, which take us to anaphase. And anaphase, we have sister chromatids are being pulled apart and moved towards the poles of the cell. This separation normally ensures new cell will have or will receive identical set of chromosomes. Remember, chromosomes break at the centromere and sister chromatids move to the opposite ends of the cell. That is the defining feature of the anaphase, which takes us to telophase, where chromatids will reach the poles of the cell, and a nuclear membrane that had disappeared in prophase will form around each set of chromosomes, and then the chromosomes will begin to decondense and back into the chromatins, right? Remember, telophase is followed by cytokinesis, which is the actual division of the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm divides, resulting into two daughter cells that are identical, okay? Each daughter cell is genetically identical to the original parent cell with the same number of chromosomes, 46 chromosomes, that is, they are diploid in nature, all right? Okay. From mitosis, we go to meiosis, and uh, meiosis is a specialized form of cell division that normally produces gametes, that is the sperm for men and the egg for the females in sexually reproducing organisms. Meiosis reproduces or reduces the chromosome number by a half, and this creates four genetically diverse daughter cells, each with half the number of chromosomes. Meiosis is very essential for genetic diversity, and it maintains the species chromosome number across generations. Meiosis occurs in two sequential stages, which involve meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Let's start with meiosis 1. And in this case, we have prophes 1, right? So we have prophes 1 of meiosis, where chromosomes are going to condense and homologous chromosomes pair up in a process called or referred to as the synapsis, right? Then we have the crossing over at the chiasmata, all right, at the chiasmata. 
Chiasmata is simply the site for synapses and crossing over. So crossing over occurs where segments of genetic material are exchanged between homologous chromosomes. And this normally increases genetic diversity. So you can be sure that the end product will not be identical. Okay, they are going to be diverse. The nuclear membrane will disintegrate and spindle fibers will attach to the homologous chromosomes. Then the homologous chromosomes will pair along the metaphyseal plate, right? And the spindle fibers will attach the homologous uh, pairs, pulling them towards the opposite poles. Homologous chromosomes and not chromatids, as in the case for the, uh, for the mitosis, are going to be separated and pulled to the opposite poles, right? Homologous chromosomes will move to the opposite poles, right? And this reduction in chromosome number, right? This normal result in chromosome number from diploid to haploid, right? And uh, the outcome, uh, which is now the key outcome of meiosis one. Homologous chromosomes are going to be separated. They will not be going to the same side, right? All right. The separated homologous chromosomes will reach the opposite pole in telophase 1, and cytokinases will occur, forming two haploid daughter cells, each with half number of the original number of chromosome number. Which gets us to uh, now meiosis 2. Meiosis 2 resembles a typical mitotic division. The only difference is that it is happening in haploid cells. Starting with process 2 of meiosis, okay, chromosomes are going to condense again and the spindle fibers will form in each haploid cell. Then the chromosomes will align at the mesophyseal plate in each of these haploid cells. Sister chromatids are separated and pulled towards opposite pole, right? And then chromatids will reach the poles and the nuclear membranes will form around each set of chromosomes. Cytokinesis will occur where the cytoplasm will divide, resulting into four haploid cells. And the unique part is that it will be each will be genetically distinct from one another and from the parent cells. And that's how we have the mitosis and meiosis. So how is cell growth um, controlled? Of course, cell growth is good to know that cell growth is a tightly regulated uh, process through a combination of both internal and external factors that ensures that cells divide, differentiate, and grow only when it is very, very necessary. So we have a number of factors that do help us control. One of it is the mitogens, uh, which you refer to them as the growth factors. These are just signaling molecules, uh, typically proteins, that is going to stimulate cell division and growth. So these growth proteins or uh, growth factors do bind to specific receptors on cell surface and activate intracellular signaling pathways that promote progression of the cell cycle from the G1 to the S phase. One of the best known growth factor is what we refer to as the EGF, epidermal growth factor, which normally stimulates growth and proliferation of epithelial cells. Another best example is the PDGF, platelet-derived growth factor. This one normally plays a critical role in wound healing by stimulating proliferation of cells such as fibroblasts. So cells only grow and divide in response to appropriate mitogens. If the necessary uh, mitogens are absent, then the cell cycle is halted. Normally, this helps in ensuring that cells only divide when needed, um, such as during tissue repair or development. Number two mechanism where cell growth is controlled is the contact inhibition, where cells run out of growth space. So, and, and it simply refers to the phenomena where cells stop dividing when they come in contact with neighboring cells. This is specifically essential in maintaining tissue architecture and preventing excessive growth. Examples will be the fibroblasts, which are the cells that are involved in wound healing. They do demonstrate conduct inhibition. So once a wound is filled with the cells, fibroblasts normally stop dividing and this prevents overcrowding. When cells touch each other, signals are sent to the nucleus to stop further cell division. This prevents uncontrolled cell growth and it's one of the ways in which normal tissues avoid overgrowth. 
Loss of contact inhibition, you have to know that is the hallmark uh, of cancer cells, which continue to divide despite contact with the neighboring cells, and this normally leads to tumor formation. The third way is the cell cycle checkpoints. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just looked at the different checkpoints uh, here. We have looked at the G1, the G2, and the M. All right. So this normally ensures proper growth and division. These checkpoints normally assess whether the cell is ready to proceed with division based on several factors such as DNA integrity and availability of nutrients. Check for instance the GYS, right? the G1S checkpoint. This normally ensures that the cell has adequate nutrients and whether the DNA is undamaged before allowing the cell to enter the S phase where DNA replication can occur. So we have a, um, an, a tumor suppressor protein. We refer to that as, as a P, P53, all right? In layman's language, in local language, we refer to it as the angel of life. This protein normally plays a key role in this checkpoint by halting the cell cycle if the DNA is, is damage is detected. And this gives the cell time to repair the damage or trigger apoptosis if the damage is irreparable. Cells will also proceed to the next phase of the cell cycle unless the conditions are favorable. And this ensures that only one health or healthy cells divide. Mutation in checkpoints proteins can lead to uncontrolled cell growth. And this is normally seen in many cancers. Number four is nutrient availability. You know, cells require energy and raw materials. Those are the nutrients in order to grow and divide. So with this, without these sufficient nutrients, cell will not progress through the cell cycle. So we have um, key nutrients, which include amino acid, glucose, lipids, nucleotides, which are very essential for DNA synthesis, protein production, and membrane formation. A good example will be for the yeast cells, where we have a TOR, the target for rapamycin. It normally signals or regulates cell growth in response to nutrient availability. So when nutrients like amino acid or glucose are scarce, target for rapamycin signaling is inhibited, and this slows slow cell growth and division. Cells monitor the internal and external availability of nutrients through metabolic sensors. If these nutrients are low, cells will enter the G0 or slow down the, the cell cycle, and this prevents division until sufficient resources are made available. The other factor is hormonal regulation. You know, hormones are chemical messengers that are normally produced by glands and they do influence cell growth. So hormonal signals regulate cell division and grow in and growth in various tissues by interacting with specific receptors and, re and activating growth pathways. Take an example of the insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1 which is normally regulated by the growth, the growth hormone. This um, factor normally promotes the growth of many tissues by stimulating cell proliferation and inhibiting apoptosis. It plays a crucial role during childhood growth and development, as well as muscle regeneration and repair in adults. So hormones normally exert tight control over growth, especially in specific life stages, e.g. childhood or puberty. So hormonal imbalances can lead to conditions like uh, gigantism, where we have excess growth due to the overproduction of growth hormone, and dwarfism due to reduced growth, uh, and this is due to insufficient growth hormone, right? And that so what is very key. So those are the different ways in which cell growth can be controlled. So out of the many tissues that we have, we have, of course, four major types of tissues. We have the epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscular tissue, nerve tissue. Out of the four, epithelial tissues, I think, are the ones that are... Um, Paid, we are going to pay more focus on the epithelial cells, right? Because this says they form continuous layers that grow, that cover the surface, line the various cavities of the body throughout. And they have major roles, including protection, secretion, absorption, and filtration. So the distribution of these epithelial cells is based on their structure and function. And with the different types of epithelial cells found in specific uh, locations, they are suited for different specialized tasks.
Like example, we have squamous epithelial cells, which are flat in nature, thin and white cells, and they are normally ideal for diffusion, filtration, due to their thin structures. Examples, we have squam simple squamous and stratified squamous. For simple squamous epithelium, it's normally found in the alveoli of the lungs where it facilitates gaseous exchange, it lines blood vessels, especially the endothelium, so it provides a smooth surface for blood flow. It's also found in the Bowman's capsule in the kidney, so this aids in filtration uh, of blood to form urine. As for the stratified squamous epithelium, uh, the, this one is made up of multiple layers of flat cells and the, very important for protection against abrasion. They could be found in the epidermis of the skin where they protect against physical damage and pathogens and can also be found in the lining of the mouth, the esophagus and the vagina where they protect against friction and mechanical stress. The second type of um, epithelial cells are the cuboidal uh, epithelial cells. They are cube-shaped and they are tall as they are uh, wide. So most of them are specialized in secretion and absorption. We have simple cuboidal epithelium and stratified cuboidal epithelium. As for the simple cuboidal epithelium, it can be found in the kidney tubules where it's involved in reabsorption of water and nutrients or in the ducts of glands like the salivary and the sweat glands where they participate and they help uh, in, the, in the secretion of substances like saliva and sweat. Simple cuboidal epithelium can also be found in the thyroid uh, gland follicles where it helps secrete thyroid hormones. Stratified cuboidal epithelium, on the other hand, uh, can be found in the ducts of the sweat glands and the mammary glands, and its major role is to protect the glands while facilitating the process of secretion. Third type of epithelial cells are the, col the columnar epithelial cells. They are tall and column-like cells taller than they are wide, and they are majorly far, uh, involved in absorption and secretion, often with specialized features like microvilli and uh, the cilia. So one of the type is the simple columnar epithelium, which is found in the lining of the small intestines, the stomach lining, and the fallopian tubes. We also have the stratified columnar epithelium, which is found in the male urethra and some gland, and some gland ducts. The fourth type of this one is uh, pseudostratified columnar, which normally appears to be stratified, but in actually, in actual, it's a single layer of cells that have varying heights, giving the illusion of multiple layers. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium is often ciliated, and the major function is help secrete mucus and move it along the surface with the help of the cilia. So if you look at distribution of pseudostratified, you could find them in the, along the respiratory tract, especially the trachea and the bronchi, and here they contain ciliated cells that help move mucus mucus and trapped particles out of the airway. They are also found in the male reproductive ducts and this in here they are involved in sperm transport, right? Okay, what about transitional epithelium? This is, these are cells that keep changing shape from between the squamous, which are flat in nature, and cuboidal, which are cubed, right, depending on the stretch and relaxation of the tissue. So these changes normally allows organs to stretch and accommodate fluctuating volumes of fluid. In terms of distribution, transitional epithelium can be found in the urinary bladder, where they allow the bladder to expand and contract as it fills and empties. It can also be found in the ureters where it can be able to stretch as urine flows uh, from the kidneys to the bladder, right? So why is the focus so much on epithelial cells and not connective at, at tissues, not muscular, not nerve? Because epithelial cells have a widespread location, right? Epithelial cells cover most surface of the body, like the skin we have mentioned, the lining of the organs, the blood vessels, and the body cavities. So given their extensive presence, epithelial cells now will be involved in a variety of pathological processes, hence the interest. Number two, epithelial cells also act as protective barriers against pathogens, toxins, mechanical damage because they are exposed to this external environment and internal body fluids. They are prone to injuries and diseases like infections, inflammation, and cancer. There is also high regeneration.
regenerative uh, capacity. Epithelial have a high rate of turnover, especially in areas like the skin and the GIT. So this constant regeneration increases the likelihood of mutations and abnormalities, making epithelial cells a common site for cancers, uh, what you refer, commonly referred as the carcinomas, right? Majority of cancers, if you look at the statistics, over 90% will originate from epithelial cells, the carcinomas, including cancers of the skin, lungs, colon, breast, and the prostate. So this high prevalence in cancer makes epithelial cells a major focus in pathology. Epithelial cells also have various roles, including secretions in glands, absorption for the intestines, filtration in the kidneys. This variety of functions increases the likelihood of dysfunction and diseases related to these processes. Lastly, epithelial cells are also implicated in many inflammatory diseases, including dermatitis, gastritis, and inflammatory bowel diseases. So their central roles in forming barriers makes them vulnerable to immune reaction and chronic inflammation. Ladies and gentlemen, we were looking at the mechanisms leading to a diseased state. And of course, just to try and define, mechanism or mechanism of a diseased state simply refers to the various physiological and cellular processes that normally occur when the body encounters stress or injury disrupting the normal function. So disease state often results from either cellular or tissue responses to injury. Or stress. So these mechanisms include cellular adaptation, injury responses, failed repair processes, all of which can relate in tissue organ, tissue dysfunction, and the development of pathological conditions. So cells adapt to changes in their environment through various uh, mechanisms just to maintain function, but this adaptation can lead to pathological state if prolonged or excessive. So these cellular adaptations help cells respond to increased or decreased workload, changes in the availability of nutrients and other environment stressors by undergoing some adaptations. And these changes could be physiological, that is normal, or pathological, which is disease-related. For the physiological adaptations, they usually represent responses of cells to normal stimulation by either hormones or endogenous chemical mediators. Could be hormone-induced enlargement of the breast on the uterus uh, during the pregnancy. As for the pathological adaptation, they are responses to stress that allow cells to modulate their structure and function and then escape the injury. And such adaptation could include atrophy, hypertrophy, metaplasia, right? And, and so many and so, so many others. Maybe we can look at them um, in bits. Let's start with atrophy. Atrophy, if you try to define it, simply refers to the decrease in cell size. And it's normally due to the loss of cell substances. And this leads to a reduction in the size of an organ or the affected tissue. Best example is muscle wasting in immobilized limbs or due to malnutrition. And the causes of atrophy could be either disuse, loss of innervation, decreased blood supply, malnutrition, or endocrine dysfunction. As for hypertrophy, hypertrophy simply refers to the increase in cell size, often leading to an increase in the size of an affected organ. So the differentiated cells have lost their ability to proliferate and thus cannot increase in number. As for the causes, it, it may be increased functional demand or hormonal stimulation, right? Hypertrophy can be physiological or pathological. So for physiological hypertrophy, this is increase in size in response to normal conditions like exercise. Can you remember the weightlifters? They can simply develop masculine uh, physique only by hypertrophy of the individual skeletal muscle cell induced by increased workload. What about pathological hypertrophy? Pathological hypertrophy refers to abnormal enlargement due to a disease. Uh, figure out the cardiac enlargement as for those guys with high, either hypertension or aortic valve disease. What about the other type that is hyperplasia? Hyperplasia, this one involves an increase in the number of cells in an organ, a tissue leading to increase in its volume. 
So it could be caused by hormonal stimulation or just normal compensatory. It could be pathological hyperplasia, right? The best example of um, hyperplasia, we could be talking of the BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, which normally leads or responsible for urinary obstruction in men. Ladies and gentlemen, we can try and differentiate between hyperplasia and hypertrophy in terms of the cell-affected molecular pathogenesis, the types where we have the physiological and pathological. We can also talk, uh, talk about the shape or the size of the cell, the morphology of the cells, the electrical microscope uh, uh, results, and the outcome of those processes to give us the differences between hyperplasia and hypertrophy. The other type of response is metaplasia, where it is a reversible replacement of one differentiated type of a cell with another that is suited to handle the stress. It could be caused by chronic irritation, nutritional deficiencies. Maybe the best example that I can give is where we have the columnar epithelium replacing squamous, uh, squamous epithelium in the esophagus due to the chronic acid reflux, increasing the risk of uh, the cancer. Dysplasia refers to the disordered growth and maturation of cells often considered as a precancerous condition. It is normally characterized by abnormal cell size, abnormal shape, and organization. It could be caused by chronic irritation or inflammation, genetic mutation, and cells in that have dysplasia, they normally lose uniformity, increased mitotic activity, and dysplasia can progress to cancer, that is neoplasia, if the stressor persists. Thus, dysplasia is a significant precursor to cancer among reasons like cellular abnormalities. You know, dysplasia involves cellular changes, such as increased nuclear size, irregular cell shape, and loss of uniformity, which are the hallmark uh, features of precancerous cells. So these changes can occur in tissues where normal cells should be orderly and mature. And then when cells become dysplastic, they lose their normal function and control over growth, which is a key step to progression to malignancy. Dysplasia also is considered as an intermediate stage between normal tissue and cancer. So if left unchecked, dysplastic cells can undergo further genetic mutation and transform into neoplastic cells, which are cancerous and have the ability to invade surrounding cells. As for the high-grade dysplasia, which is often uh, regarded as carcinoma in situ, this is a stage where abnormal cells have yet have, are, are not yet invaded nearby tissues, but have high potential for progressive into invasive cancer. Some cases, you find that dysplasia uh, may be reversible. So if the underlying cause, for example, the chronic irritation or in a infection is removed or treated. For example, we have those cervical dysplasia normally caused by the HPV virus, the human papilloma virus infection. It can regress if the infection is cleared. However, if not managed or treated appropriately, dysplasia can continue to evolve and make Early, you know, making early detection and intervention becomes more critical for that process. Many cancer screening programs, such as the pap smears for the cervical cancer or the colonoscopies for colorectal cancer, normally aim to detect dysplasia, right? Those abnormal cells before they can progress to full-blown cancer. Identifying these dysplastic cells normally allows for early treatment and reduces the risk of cancer development. Lastly, we have the tissue-specific examples for the dysplasia, like uh, cervical dysplasia, where it's commonly detected during pap smear and is associated with HPV infection. It can progress to cervical cancer if left unchecked. The Barrett's esophagus, where this is a condition where there is chronic acid reflux causing dysplasia in the esophageal lining, increasing the risk of esophageal cancer. What about the adenomatous polyps in the colon? These are benign growths in the, with the dysplastic changes that may progress to colorectal cancer if not removed. All right? All right, guys. What about the mechanism of cellular injury? 
so so when when the adaptive capacity of a cell is exceeded the cell cannot undergo hypertrophy um hypertrophy hyperplasia metaplasia you know injury normally occurs and this could lead to a diseased state so injury you find this injury can be reversible or irreversible depending on the duration and the severity of the stress so for the reversible injury we find that you could have cellular swelling fatty changes and bleeding of the plasma membrane can occur but can be reversed if the stimuli is removed as for the irreversible injury it could lead to cell death and uh, which is usually um, mediated by maybe necrosis or apoptosis right Apo necrosis is uncontrolled cell growth due to external injury or normal leading to inflammation. On the other hand, apoptosis is a programmed cell death and a controlled process that is essential for tissue uh, hemostasis. Ladies and gentlemen, if you look at my right, we have some of the differences between reversible and irreversible cell injury, right? And also equally, the, change, the, the difference between necrosis and apoptosis apoptosis right you could pause a video and make those recording in our books all right so what are the major causes of cellular injury we have oxygen deprivation right oxygen deprivation physical agent chemical agents infectious agents immunological reactions genetic factors nutritional imbalances um nutritional imbalances those are some of the causes of cellular injury so if the stress continues or is severe, adaptive mechanism have failed, it could lead to permanent damage and diseases. So that we are talking of chronic inflammation, which normally leads to tissue damage and fibrosis, uncontrolled cell proliferation that is seen in cancer, and organ dysfunction due to cellular death uh, and, and, fib and fibrosis, such as the liver cirrhosis and heart and heart failure. So in summary, guys, uh, when looking at mechanism leading to a disease state, we will have to pay more attention to how the cell normally adapts to stress. The cell could hypertrophy where cells enlarge to meet increased functional demand, or cells could proliferate to increase tissue size, that is hyperplasia. Cell can also shrink to conserve energy and reduce workload, and cells can transform to a better type, okay, from one differentiated type to another, just to withstand the environmental, the environmental stress, right? The environmental stress. So when you have a normal cell, uh, for us to maintain the homeostasis, the cell has to be able to adapt well to the increased stress and the demand. With has inability to adapt then it can easily result into cell injury and cell death all right okay ladies and gentlemen in our presentation today you need to be at least be in a position to define what um human pathology is you should be able to explain the processes involved in mitosis and meiosis also describe the distribution of epithelial in uh, cells in the body. Now, okay, LA simple square mass, stratified square mass, columnar, different types of epithelial cells in our bodies. You should be able at least to explain five ways in which cell growth can be controlled. Describe five ways in which cells can adapt to stress. Explain five causes of cellular injury. And lastly, be able to differentiate between apoptosis and necrosis okay until next time take care of yourself guys